Whether you have a skin interest, a skin query, a skin trauma, or skin disease, I warmly welcome you to Heal Thy Skin, a podcast brought to you by Derm Health Co. I'm Marnie, dermal clinician, dermoscopist, and your podcast host. Skin is deeper than beauty, and our mission is to build the largest platform of specialized practitioners focused on skin health and skin empowerment. Join me each week where we go deep into the skin and beyond to hear stories and education from leading practitioners on a journey of skin health. Loving the Heal Thy Skin podcast? If you enjoy listening, take a screenshot of this episode and tag us for a feature on our socials at dermhealth.co. Welcome to the Heal Thy Skin podcast. I'm Marnie, your host, and today I'm speaking with Prudvi Kaka, Chief Scientific Officer at Desium, the abnormal beauty company. When it comes to finding an effective adult acne treatment, you've likely tried every lotion, potion, and serum out there, but it also helps to get to the root of the problem. In other words, to really treat your adult acne, you may need to understand what causes it in the first place. Like most things in life, acne is not always completely in one's control. There are, however, some key tips to keep in mind to prevent breakouts. Desium is arguably one of the most talked about beauty companies in the industry, and Prudvi joined Desium way back in 2014 and has been one of the pioneers. He has a degree in pharmaceutical sciences and advanced degree in biotechnology. He used this experience to bring a unique perspective to the beauty industry. He views skincare not just as luxury, but a healthcare necessity. I love this. Listener Prudvi debunks the misconceptions about adult acne and talks about the science behind skincare formulations. I started by asking Prudvi what he thought was the biggest misconception about adult acne. There are a few factors like diet, facial hygiene, and sun exposure. And, and I'll go a little granular on what people think. So people think fatty foods or greasy foods can aggravate acne, but there are no real clinical or factual studies that prove that it actually does. You know, on the other spectrum, there are a few links that say low glycemic foot helps and high glycemic foot food actually stimulates more insulin. But again, it has been very subjective and it's not proven till today. And when it comes to facial hygiene, people think not maintaining proper routine in terms of face wash, that it can lead to acne. And sometimes people do overly wash their skin and it actually exacerbates acne. So even in here, there are no proven facts around what is actually the balanced condition. And when it comes to sun exposure, as I mentioned, one usually thinks that exposing themselves to strong UV or sunlight actually helps in acne, but it actually does the opposite. It actually exacerbates and it may lead to melanoma skin cancer. I mean, based on the current evidence, none of these factors are said that they actually exacerbate acne. So there's no generic approach here. It's always subjective and clinicians or physicians are the best ones to advise on why acne is causing it in an individual. Yeah, I think that's really good advice because you often hear someone say, I ate this and all of a sudden the next morning I woke up with this huge zit. And it's not always the correlation, but when we do have adult acne, for example, we're always looking for reasons as to why that might have happened. And it's quite easy to blame it on our diet or something that we ate. Are you able to explain what causes adult acne, like the mechanism and what's actually happening within the skin? There are different phases, Marnina, than the acne formation. I think one should know the terminologies first. I mean, there are a few terms called papule, pustule, nodule, lesion. So maybe I'll clarify what those terms are, and then I'll actually jump into the actual flow. Yes. So, I mean, papule is like a raised area. Like when there is an elevation on the skin, that's called a papule. When there is a bulged patch on the skin, that's usually filled with pus. That's called a pustule. And a nodule is usually an abnormal tissue growth. 
and lesion is actually a damaged tissue or skin. It usually occurs in multiple conditions. If there's an injury, disease, or rehab, that's usually seen. So coming to, coming to the flow, when sebum is secreted excessively, sebum starts to build up. And once the gland and the area around the gland are locked, which as well happens with proliferation of dead cells and accumulation of sebum and waste together leads to a microcomedome. And eventually what happens is the pore walls around the glands and the area is usually closed and the accumulation even happens intensely. So to look out on the skin, it actually starts as a very small elevation or a discoloration and eventually it starts to form as a papule or a pustule. And when we go deeper after closing, it even multiplies even more. And later within the sebaceous gland area, the pore kind of widens and it creates a hostile environment for the propioni bacterium. And as it creates that environment, it actually proliferates and makes it even wider. And all of a sudden now it's like a swollen pustule. And as it increases, it leads to inflammation because that propioni bacterium actually releases enzymes called protease and lipase, and they actually break the cell wall and it actually enters into the dermis which makes it more than localized. And now we're talking about a nodule and it can evidently be seen on the skin. So pretty much in a nutshell, we're talking about different phase where a simple discoloration to a white head, to a black head, to an inflammation, to a scar. So pretty much that's the flow. Yeah, okay. So there's obvious flow that you're not all of a sudden going to wake up with a nodule. It's going to be this progression. There are some distinct grades of acne. Some may require some more medical type treatments. Are you able to just talk us through those different grades and what they are? Grading is really subjective. Again, it depends on the severity. It, it depends on the lesions, it depends on the inflammation and extent. So generally, there's no one grading that's universally accepted. But again, one should be more accurate and reproducible, and it should help towards kind of documenting it. It should be simple and reflective of the subjective criteria. So pretty much those are the conditions to rely on when someone is looking into the grading criteria. Again, there are many grading systems that are available. I mean, I'll talk about one that was developed by Cook et al. He used pretty much the photographic standards, pretty much from grade zero to eight. How it's described is when you see up to three small comedones or papules, it would be a grade zero and very few pustules to like a few dozen papules or comedone, that's a grade two. When there are a lot of red lesions and inflammation is very significant, it's a grade four. When it's loaded with comedones and multiple pustules and lesions of a size of 2.5 centimeter, it's a grade of six. And when there is cystic type acne covering most of the face, it's a grade eight. So that's pretty much the grading. Okay, and explain how acne can become a vicious cycle because as we know, there's lots involved with acne. It, it's not just simply you know, skin hygiene. There's inflammation, which then impairs the skin barrier. There can be hormones, sebum production, etc. So are you able to explain the relationship between all of these things? So pretty much stress and hormones are kind of very related because hormones in general, like androgens, Androgen's primary outcome is to increase sebum production. And we've just spoken about what happens after sebum production, as in the microcomedone formation, the comedones, the pustules, and the nodules, pretty much the same flow. One relation, as I said, between stress and hormones is when someone is stressed, their bodies could produce androgens. That could be mental stress. And when it comes to physical stress, it can also trigger some hormonal changes and it could weaken one's immunity and few other factors like whether lack of sleep or illness or dehydration or exposing themselves to like pollution, which is like particulate matter pollution. All of these are kind of interconnected 
And, and again, as we spoke within hormones and stress, like one way is we all know the sebum. So excess oil, which can clog pores, rapid turnover on the scale, which is also called as follicular hyperkeratosis and presence of a lot of propionium bacterium could all cause and lead to acne vulgaris. And sometimes medications, when we're talking about like antidepressants and when we're using drugs like lithium or uh, amexapine, they have tendency to cause acne as well. And most importantly, like the genetic predisposition, like if someone in the family has acne, it could also lead to acne. And it generally starts pretty much topical and then it goes deeper and deeper. And as it gets deeper, it just forms into a cyst. Pretty much that's like the heightened acne. If someone has one of those lower grades acne, if it's untreated, how likely is it that it's going to progress to one of those later stages? I mean, it all depends on how, what is the source of acne there? I mean, if the source is stress, then again, it depends on if they could change their lifestyle or if they're able to manage stress that could quickly bring their skin back to normal. Or if it is related to a medication, let's say antidepressants. Antidepressants can lead to acne. And if one notices and understands that it is due to antidepressants, then going on to another type of antidepressant would, would relieve from acne. So talk to us about some of the current treatment options for those with adult acne. And I'm aware that, you know, it can be as there can be as many treatment options as there are reasons for someone actually experience acne. But talk to us through some of the most common types of treatments. And then we're going to get a little deeper into the ingredients used after. So pretty much it, it depends on the severity of acne. So when we're talking about like simple comedonal ac acne, a topical rectinoid could actually be just enough. And as it progresses to a papillar or pristillar, then a combination of topical retinoid and a topical antimicrobial is needed. When it gets to moderate or severe, then we're talking about oral antibiotics and like an oral isotretinoin and even high doses of those. So it really depends on the severity of acne and what is actually causing it. So in regards to ingredients used for acne management, what are some of the hero ingredients? As we all know, there are two different categories, right? There is a topical solutions that we all know, which are the benzyl peroxides, the clindamycins, the retinoid category, the salicylic, the, uh, the azelaic acids, the alpha hydroxies. Again, there's different mechanisms behind each of them. And on the other side, we got those oral antibiotics or oral isotretinoids. So coming to benzyl peroxide, which is one of the most known topical format. And the way that helps is through minimizing the proliferation of P-acne. And likewise, retinoids. Retinoids inhibits the microcomita formation, and it also reduces the inflammation. And one beautiful thing about retinoids is that it also helps in restructuring of the dermis area, as in the collagen or elastin. So pretty much those are like few well-known ingredients. I mean, when it comes to a few other, like if you take salicylics or alpha hydroxy acids, they help in, in renewing the skin, which ultimately prevents clogging of pores and removes any kind of scars that are on the topical skin. And azelaic acid is another one, which acts as a comedolytic antimicrobial and also helps against inflammation. And when it comes to uh, the oral antibiotics like tetracyclines or erythromycins, I mean, pretty much they are like antimicrobial. And an example, if you talk about tetracyclines on how they kind of help the situation is they inhibit like the protein synthesis within the P acne. And when it comes to isotretinoin, I mean, the mechanism involved for isotretinoin is it decreases the size and activity of sebaceous gland, which is pretty much the core when it comes to acne. Amazing how those ingredients can actually work on the mechanism right down to the cellular level. I'd like to hear more about some of the ingredients that it might be used for like the skin barrier, because we know if someone has acne, they are more inclined to want to wash all the time or exfoliate all the time. And we know that this can lead to impaired skin barrier and increased inflammation. So what are some of the ingredients that are used to assist in repairing that skin barrier and reducing inflammation from more of a healing perspective? 
And it really depends, right? Because there is acute and, and chronic conditions. Again, any chronic conditions has to be properly diagnosed and treated. But when it comes to like maintenance, a simple alpha hydroxy acid can help in renewing and refreshing the skin. And when it comes to like an acute inflammation, azelaic acid could be a good help in terms of minimizing that inflammation that could be forming due to the early stages of acne. Now, in regards to ingredients, there's home products and then there's more professional treatments. And they can sometimes have a crossover in regards to the ingredients that are actually used. However, obviously, the strength is completely different. Sometimes people are under the impression that the higher the percentage or the stronger it is, the better it is. But I'd like to hear more about just daily skincare, how ingredients are perhaps found. So you've mentioned some of the main ingredients, but where do we see them? Do we see them in serums, cleansers, masks? What are the best ways that some of these ingredients are actually used? Because we know that, say, something that's going to stay on the skin for a lot longer might not be as good if it is a really high strength percentage or something like that. So talk to us about the actual preparations of home care and these ingredients that you mentioned before. So to me, this is one of the greatest questions because cosmetics and pharmaceutical drugs there is a difference and a line between them. As you mentioned, there could be crossovers, but when it comes to the format of products or the strength of products, there is a huge difference. So, I mean, when we're talking about salicylic acid, salicylic acid at 2% has its objective. An objective is to being a comedolytic or or being a keratolytic and kind of refreshing the skin is what is seen as a cosmetic benefit. Again, it's all very superficial, but when it comes to like a medicated salicylic acid, the strength is way higher and the efficacy and the mechanism is much deeper. So to me, cosmetics or any home care products, again, we're talking about non-OTC home care products. They are just for cosmetic purposes and all they can do is very superficial. But when it comes to like treating a diseased condition or treating acne in this scenario, it's more important to rely on OTC products and OTC drugs. What do you mean by OTC? OTC. Oh, so I mean, in North America, OTC is over the counter. Oh, yes, of course, of course. Yeah, which is like a 10% benzoyl peroxides or 10% salicylic acid formulations. Yeah, so you need Uh, the help from the pharmacist. You can't just grab these off the shelf. That's right. But then when it comes to, let's say, someone is just off their acne medication, and if someone needs a little bit of boost in clearing up things superficially, that's when home care products come into existence. Rather than using them to cure or treat acne, using them as a boost and giving that cosmetic elegance is is what is important to think of when looking at home care products. Yeah, of course. So for example, if someone has a lot of buildup of dead skin, hyperkeratosis, and their normal AHA isn't necessarily working, they can use something that's perhaps over the counter. And because they don't have that buildup around the follicle, then their cosmetic products are going to work more effectively. Is that kind of what you mean by just kind of elaborating on them working together? Yeah, that's right. Because you don't want to continue using your drugs as they have their implications. I mean, if you take isotretinoin as an example, yes, isotretinoin reduces your sebaceous gland size and activity but you don't want that to be continued for longer because that leads to excessive drying. So you just want to limit yourself in using your medications as prescribed by a physician. But at the same time, you want to complement your therapy with some home care products that can add a little bit of boost, but one should understand that cosmetics are not to be used for cure or treating a disease. Yeah, of course. So they can definitely help when used in conjunction with in-clinic treatments and when you're using perhaps over-the-counter as well. But they're really about moisturizing, protecting the barrier, protecting us from the outside world, as in the case of antioxidants and things like that. In regards to antioxidants and the free radicals that are caused from acne, what's your kind of stance on promoting antioxidants for those with acne? Are there some that we should avoid or are some that are better than others for people with acne? I mean, antioxidant 
or the mechanism around it is super complex. Again, it could all come from inflammation, but, but as you know, it's a chain-like process. Buildup of like free radicals can lead to multiple events. We know from the pathogenesis of acne, inflammation has a really big prominence. And if you ask me what antioxidants would benefit from it, so that's where, again, I would say cosmetics should only be used as a conjunction and coming to those, something like superoxide dismutase or pycnogenol are the types that one should be looking at. Now, I want to jump back a little bit because earlier on, we were talking about some of the potential causes for acne, I mean, in particular, adult acne. Now, Obviously, we can't just cut out everything. We can't just stop eating, stop using everything. What should the process of elimination be if someone is experiencing acne and they're trying to determine what the actual trigger is? I think the biggest part here is education, right? Because I mean, anyone in their like teenage, even I was prone to acne in my mid-20s, and the biggest lacking factor was education. Like I was treated with acne and it worked very well and I'd never had acne after but I never knew what caused it at that time. And, and I don't, I mean, I didn't realize how quickly it was eliminated. So the biggest factor here is educating everyone with all the factors that could cause acne, pretty much whatever we talked about earlier, which could be hormonal, it could be physical, it could be mental, it could be drugs, it could be like pollution. So pretty much giving everyone an overview. And I think the best one to do it is actually the clinician or the physician because there's no one generic approach to handle acne. It's very subjective. So pretty much the physician or the clinician's role is to, rather than just curing it, it, it would be very helpful for one to understand how it's being originated and kind of explaining one would have more better approach than anything. Mm. And I guess it takes that self-reflection as well, like working with your clinician or physician and then learning about the potential causes and then having an amount of self-reflection to say, yeah, I am actually a lot more stressed than usual, or yes, I haven't been sleeping as well, or my hormones, you know, I may have just come off some contraceptive pill or something and being able to link things back and even perhaps keeping a journal or writing it down when your symptoms are worse could be some effective ways to kind of measure that as well. Now, Prudviv, we've talked about the ingredients that are used acne treatment. What are some common ingredients that should be avoided if someone is experiencing acne? Exfoliating beads in the washes. Yes. <laughs> or, or fragrances or some esters, example, like isopropyl myristate or isopropyl palmitate or alcohol or butters. There are multiple, but the basic concept around why these ingredients is they could be comedogenic or they could be overly drying or they could be overly irritating. So pretty much anything that you can think of could actually exacerbate that should be avoided. We had a podcast guest on here a few weeks ago and she said, if your skin feels tight after a cleanse, it's too clean. We often look for that a feeling of our skin feeling nice and tight, but in fact, this is probably a clue that our skin, you know, our sebum is being completely stripped. What happens when we are using these more harsh type ingredients too often? Obviously, AHAs and things can be beneficial, but if we're using them every day, we can increase inflammation. But then what happens to the sebum and that kind of acne cycle? So it really depends on the subject. I mean, let's say if we're using too much of AHAs on a super sensitive skin. Again, what is recommended is it, it is always better to start with a lower concentration, build that resistance, and kind of progressing to higher concentrations. But let's say if someone starts with a higher concentration, then, then we're talking about like a serious reaction. And, and even if someone are used to using acids and if they overly use them, then pretty much they're disrupting their barrier. They're disrupting their microbiota. They are disrupting the regular mechanisms within the skin and skin is always flared up and ready to get irritated, inflamed. And I know why, but why shouldn't we use things that have like physical exfoliation beads? 
if someone has like a pustule or a papule, they could be exacerbating. They could overly irritate the localized lesion, which is why it's highly recommended to avoid any physical exfoliants when someone is experiencing acne. Yes, don't use apricot scrub. Don't use physical beads. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, I'd like to hear some of your advice for someone that might be experiencing acne. Have you got three kind of top tips that you can share? Yes. So one biggest tip is you should let your skin heal normally. One should not try to pop or squeeze, which would actually make it worse and takes more longer. And it could actually lead to a scar. Two is trying to avoid like the tanning beds. I mean, tanning pretty much disrupts the barrier, it damages the skin. And the light that comes out of the tanning beds could actually be exacerbating acne. And my last advice is, I mean, when you see the early symptoms of acne, no matter if they last like very short or long, you should go see a dermatologist and you should kind of get a consultation on why it's happening and kind of asking as many questions as you can to educate yourself to know the reasoning. And if it ever gets severe, yeah, I mean, they would be the best ones to recommend the medications. Got a couple of questions in regards to tanning beds. Thankfully, they have been banned here in Australia, although people can still use them for personal use. I know there are some backyard traders happening, unfortunately. But what about just natural sunlight? How can this affect acne? As, as I said in my first response, people think that exposing themselves to strong UV or sunlight would actually reduce acne. But it's not always true because, again, we're talking about some serious inflammation if someone is overly exposed and we're talking about melanoma, which is like skin cancer. So, I mean, to today, there's no strong evidence that suggests that sunlight can actually minimize acne. I'm really glad that you pointed that out because that was something that in my teens, you know, my parents or friends would say, go for a swim in the ocean and go sit out in the sun and it'll help with your acne. So I'm glad that that's debunked because I don't know how many potential skin cancers that kind of myth has potentially caused for people over the years. So good one on debunking that. Now, I'd like to hear a little bit more about you, the work that you do and Desium. Sure. So I mean, pretty much I've been with Desium for over six years. I mean, I come from a pharmaceutical background and biotechnology as well. I mean, but when I first joined at Desium, pretty much I was the only one. I mean, the, the structure was really flat. Today, we got multiple departments here. Uh, I mean, starting from R&D formulations to clinical research, to science communication, to regulatory, quality, microbiology, analytical. So pretty much my role here is to oversee all the departments. And we're over 60 people at the moment, just within the scientific team. Wow, fantastic. And yeah, it's amazing how in the space of what, six years, it's now a global company with, I think, is it 2,000 staff? Over 1,000. Yeah, over 1,000. Incredible, incredible. So thank you so much for being a guest on today's show, joining us all the way from Toronto, Canada. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. So much information about topical skincare and acne. Lots and lots of gold. Prudvi shared with us the heaps of information and the three deeper than skin insights that stood out to me were number one, sun exposure and acne. How many times have you heard either your grandparents, parents, friends say go for a swim out in the ocean, get some sun and it's going to cure or reduce your acne? The fact is that sun exposure may cause some serious inflammation if someone's overly exposed and also increase the chances of melanoma. So today there's really no strong evidence that sunlight can actually minimize acne and I'd recommend not using this as a source or a, um, a method to try and alleviate or reduce your acne breakouts. Number two, as Prudvi said, the grading scales of acne can be quite different, and that's on a clinical level. 
So the severity of acne on a personal level can also vary greatly between each individual. And we may see someone with a couple of discrete blemishes, what we think, but for them, it may be really significant. So it is really important not to undermine or underestimate how acne can affect somebody. If you or someone you know is feeling that acne is causing anxiety, psychosocial changes, then I encourage you to have a consultation with a professional. And number three, I'm so glad Prudvi spoke about the benefits of retinoids and acne. Love them. Regulating sebum production, modulating cell turnover, and increases uniformity in skin cells. So this makes the skin cells sit nice and snug next to each other. It doesn't go without warning, though. Ensure that any skin care is recommended by a qualified practitioner or healthcare professional. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Heal Thy Skin podcast. If you enjoyed listening, take a screenshot of this episode and tag us for a feature on our socials at dermhealth.co. Until next week, be skin powered.